Goedemiddag op deze Koningsdag vanuit Amsterdam, Engeland en Zweden voor dit debat over de film The Man Who Shouldn't Be King. Um, we zullen dit debat in het Engels doen, uh, uh, omdat we uh, zo ook verstaanbaar zijn voor onze vrienden in Engeland en Zweden. Um, we gaan het hebben over, uh, zoals gezegd, deze documentaire. En um, dan ga ik vanaf nu verder in het Engels. With us are Crane Smith, who is the head of Republic in the UK, the Republican Society. Good afternoon. How are you? Hi, Flores. How are you? Very fine. It's a sunny day and it's very quiet, actually, though it's King's Day. Happy well, King's Day. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, with us is uh, Ole Nijkstedt. I have to pronounce this well. Did I pronounce that well? No, it's it good. It's good. Good. You're from the Republic. You should. Uh, you should help me here. Republic the Republic of Yes, that's it. <laughs> that the society in uh, Sweden. Um, with both of you, we will debate uh, on this documentary, "The Man Who Shouldn't Be King," made by the British Republican Society Republic. Um, for everybody following us today and staying home, as you should, um, you are very. Uh, much invited to debate with us. Uh, leave your comments on YouTube and on Facebook um, so we can, uh, we can get into your, all your questions and your remarks so far. Um, starting with you, Graham. You, I know you. I think uh, uh, most people in Great Britain know you. Uh, people in Holland hey. know not. Uh, but you're the head of the uh, British Republican Society of Republic. Um, you are the spokesman of the Republican Society and uh, you are quite well uh, in the British media. I've seen you a lot on BBC, I uh, heard you a lot in newspapers and on the radio, um, but as it turns out, you are a filmmaker as well. Well, of, of a sort, yeah. Um, we've spent the last few years making this documentary about uh, Charles. Um, it focuses on him for two reasons. We started off wanting to challenge his uh, supposed ownership of the Duchy of Cornwall, um, but also we want to focus on him because he's going to be our king very soon. And he, as an individual, raises all sorts of problems. Um, there's a lot of question marks about what sort of king he's going to be. And uh, I think that there's a lot of evidence in the way he's behaved as Duke of Cornwall about, you know, the, the attitude towards tenants that live on his land, the attitude towards the government and the way he lobbies. Uh, so, yeah, it's just a way of uh, using Prince Charles really as a, as a sort of a, a lesson about the failings of monarchy and why we really need to be able to choose our next set of states. That's, uh, that's rather interesting. Is such a movie, is that effective? Uh, and I'll turn to you, uh, Ola. Obviously, you haven't made a movie yet about the monarchy in Sweden, but what kind of effect do you think such a movie can, can have? Uh, well, of course, I, I feel like it could be a very effective way to get the Republican message across in the sense that it's easily digestible. And uh, we have, in Sweden, we have a book which deals with a lot of the for the royal corruption, but it really hasn't gained the momentum or traction that we hoped or we actually thought it would. But it's also because it's it's probably not as digestible as a, a movie. And so I, I I mean I would love to to do a movie instead after watching this one because I thought it was it was really well produced. So yeah, obviously the uh, British Crown uh, is very well known. Uh, probably just a little bit better than the royals in Sweden. Um, still, uh, uh, there is a lot of controversy around the British monarchy. Uh, do you think uh, uh, it can be effective making a movie about the Swedish monarchy? I, I actually think so, yes. And and as I, I go back to the, the fact that I feel like that that's a very easily digestible format for most people. So if you expose a lot of the corruption or the inner workings that most people don't know, I, I feel like that would be a good way to sort of enlighten people and to uh, to get them on board with our message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, that's uh, very interesting. Just interrupting you, um, uh, as people are following us on Facebook and on YouTube, uh, please leave all your questions and your comments below. Um, uh, if you have any question for me, uh, from the Dutch Republican Society of Pepe de Gans Nootschap, or for Graham of the Republican Society in Britain, Republic, or Ola of the Swedish Republican Society, which obviously the name I can't pronounce as Swedish is just a little bit more difficult than English. Uh, we're talking about the uh, documentary, The Man Who Shouldn't Be King, about Prince Charles. Um, and uh, as, as you already noted, Graham, you, you started out with making a documentary about the, the um, particular uh, uh, what power holds uh, uh, um, on, the, on the islands uh, uh, and, and a certain um, a possessions he has. Um, it does go into, into finances as well. And if I'm not mistaken, and if I've uh, made uh, my notes well, um, the British monarchy costs approximately 335 million pounds per year. Yeah, 345 million. I mean, that's a, that's a conservative estimate. It's probably more than that. Um, the problem is that they don't tell us all of the figures. They say that they cost us around 40 million pounds uh, every year plus at the moment for the next few years another 40 million pounds so that they can spend money on fixing Buckingham Palace, which is um, in a pretty poor state of disrepair. So the 345 million pounds that we've come up with, um, which is detailed, and I'll go through a couple of the points in a moment, but it, it, there is a report in full on our website, but that um, is so much different to the 40 million they claim because they just don't admit huge amounts of costs. It's estimated that the security for the royal family is in the region of a 100 million pounds, which is again and probably a conservative estimate. The Duchy of Cornwall that I mentioned, uh, that is public land, and that makes about 20 million pound profit, which we allow Prince Charles to keep every year. Uh, a similar amount is allowed uh, for the Queen from the Duchy of Lancaster. And when they go around the country visiting places, cutting ribbons, and so on that costs the local councils and local police forces a lot of money as well. So um, it is an estimate, but we're fairly certain it's conservative. So it's a very expensive institution. As we are celebrating King's Day here in the Netherlands today, uh, um, celebrating, uh, not all of us, but uh, uh, it is King's Day today. Uh, um, a lot of people, I get a lot of comments from people in the Netherlands, friends who say, well, you know, a monarchy obviously costs a lot of money, um, but compare it to a presidency, Oh, that costs a lot of money as well. Um, what do you have to say to them, no, Graham? Well, you've got to compare like for like. I mean, if you compare, say, the Dutch monarchy with the US presidency, then obviously the US is more expensive, but that's not what we're comparing. You've got to compare it with, say, the German uh, presidency or the Irish presidency, and it is a lot, lot cheaper. Uh, it's certainly cheaper than the British monarchy. Um, but also, it's not, I guess the question is, would a Dutch president or a British president be as expensive as a royal. Now, the reason why royals are more expensive is because they can get away with spending money that others wouldn't get away with. Um, I think it's very unlikely that an elected uh, official or an appointed official who is accountable would spend the kind of money that royals do because they would be thrown out of their job. No, no. It's 345 million pounds, uh, uh, according to your estimate, uh, the total cost of the British, British monarchy. Um, here in the Netherlands, the Republican Society of Gifted Against Notes have made an estimate two years ago saying that the total cost of the monarchy is approximately 350 million euro. So that's rather comparable. Um, yep. How is that for Sweden, Olaf? I feel that's comparable uh, if you take into account the like population and whatnot, we estimate that our monarchy costs about somewhere in the vicinity of 115, 120 million euros. And, and of course, this is large, I mean, depends on what kind of assumptions you make when you do the estimate and what you choose to count and not. But I, I feel like that's a comparable sum of money to both the Netherlands and, uh, and the UK. So yeah. It, it, as Graham said, just the security alone costs too much. So, yeah. That's, uh, it's, it's a lot of money. For people joining us right now, I'll be repeating this once in a while. If you join us now, 
via Facebook or uh, on YouTube. Uh, we are speaking in English. There's nothing wrong with your sound. Um, we are debating a movie made by the British Republican Party, Republican of Republic, about uh, Prince Charles. It's called The Man Who Shouldn't Be King. Um, and with us are Graham uh, of Republic and Ulla of the Swedish Republican Society. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them below on YouTube or on Facebook so we can debate about your questions might they arise. Um, we were talking about the finances. You go into the political power as well. As I understood, and as over the last couple of days, again, I have been debating the monarchy a lot. People say, people around me say um, that, uh, uh, that they, well, obviously uh, they cost money. President costs a lot of money, um, but they don't have real power. Um, uh, how about the before we go to the Dutch and the Swedish? Uh, how's that for the British monarchs? Do they have any power, or or has that changed or shifted over the last couple of years? No, I mean as you probably know, we don't have a written constitution. We've never gone through that moment of uh, huge change where we've written it all down. So it's kind of evolved since the late um, the late eighteenth century. Uh, when of course William of Orange invaded, and uh, <laughs> with the with the acquiescence of the British Parliament, um, and uh, the the upshot of that is that there are two aspects to this question. Firstly, the Queen, in theory, has huge amounts of power, but that is royal prerogative power, which is exercised by government ministers. Now that is a problem because it's far too much power that is not directly accountable to Parliament, which is not properly scrutinized um, and it's quite excessive it makes um, the power of the uh, the government quite um, disproportionate it's I would say that the British government is one of the most powerful in terms of domestic policy because of the royal powers that they have access to on the other hand the royals themselves and the monarch have power to influence to interfere and to um, also to lobby on their own for their own interests so Prince Charles is the, the main or the most obvious example of this, which is another reason why we flagged it up as a, a big issue in the film, but a reason why we also uh, have concerns about Charles. So on the one hand, he will lobby on a whole range of different issues, whether it's the environment or education or health. He can do that in secret. He can do that with um, complete access to government papers. So he knows well in advance what uh, ministers are talking about. Um, and he can write letters that no one can ever know about. Um, and we know from various uh, anecdotal stories over the years that this has had an influence. Um, they can also lobby for their own interests. So they've successfully lobbied to increase the, the secrecy uh, and to improve their financial arrangements. So uh, there are a number of different details in the way that that works. But there is a, it all is using power that is granted under the royal banner, as it were. So there's prince's consent, queen's consent, and uh, the royal prerogative. And it, it all kind of um, creates these uh, a number of different uh, serious problems. I know that the, uh, the, the Dutch monarchs obviously uh, um, uh, don't have direct power anymore. Uh, that was all changed 170 years ago um, when we got an constitution. Um, we now uh, live in the so-called uh, constitutional monarchy. Um, but still, uh, uh, I think what I see in the documentary uh, uh, is that maybe they don't have any direct power comparable by, uh, with, with the Dutch, but yep. still um, there is a lot of influence. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Queen can't say, right, we will now introduce a new policy on, on education, obviously, but um, we know that Prince Charles has lobbied uh, on all these issues and has been successful in various cases. Now, of course, we have a devolved uh, government in Scotland and we know that um, we know what Prince Charles's views are on education. He set up a charity to promote those views. And then we know that the uh, Scottish government under Alex Salmond adopted policies which were in line with those views. And we know that Prince Charles lobbies the Scottish government as he does with the British government. So. Um, we also know that homeopathy and other forms of alternative medicine 
have been available on the National Health Service, uh, despite the fact that everybody in the National Health Service, more or less, thinks that this is a waste of public uh, money. Now, whatever you think of homeopathy or alternative medicine, the NHS in this country should be run based on what the doctors uh, advise and not what Prince Charles thinks. And, and yet uh, it's been said by one of the leading experts on homeopathy, uh, a scientist called Ed Zernst, um, who has researched this, that one of the reasons why homeopathy remains uh, available or ha has done, I think it's now being uh, phased out, um, is because of royal interference. So, and the Queen, I believe, as well as Charles, have, have used alternative medicines. So we know that there is a an element of very direct in, in, interference an influence which has an impact on government policy but you say uh, uh, interference uh, you talk about well i myself mentioned influence uh, they have influence but does that uh, um does the does the movie show that their particular influence uh, actually affects policy can you say that well policy has changed because of the influence of the king or or, or, or the people yeah i mean there's, so there's two things here again is that there is specific policies such as the provision of homeopathy or education policy which we know has been altered or um, introduced because of lobbying from Prince Charles or his charities which work on his behalf but then there are a whole load of laws which have been amended specifically for him so um, the Duchy of Cornwall which he is allowed to run as if it's his own uh, private little empire um, has all sorts of legal exemptions. Now, some of those laws are tailored so that the law doesn't apply to them. Other laws are tailored so that it does apply to them. But if they break the law, there's no uh, there's no sanction. There's no consequence. Um, so, for example, if you are a leaseholder in this country, which means you own the property that you live in, but you don't own the land that it's on, you have certain rights in terms of buying the land under your house. If you happen to live on land owned by the Duchy of Cornwall, Prince Charles, you don't have that right because they made sure that that law didn't apply to Prince Charles. Um, the most bizarre example is that we have a law in this country against causing nuclear explosions. I'm not quite sure why, but uh, kind of if you, nuclear explosions. Now, um, for some well, reason, um, yeah, nuclear explosions. So if for some reason Prince Charles wanted to detonate a nuclear bomb, uh, he is not covered by that law, and therefore it would not. <laughs> he couldn't be prosecuted on it, under it, uh, which is no bizarre. But um, I guess he'd be prosecuted for something else. But I mean, you know, there are a long list of laws, some of which are quite serious in terms of planning, um, land use, and uh, rights to minerals and that sort of thing. Um, so there are there is a real impact uh, on. Um, on the other people's lives, people that are affected by the way these laws are, uh, are managed on land that is owned by the Dutch. How's that for Sweden, uh, Olaf? Uh, as I understood, uh, uh, Sweden is a so-called constitutional monarchy as well. Uh, the crown's uh, power is, is um, held by the constitution. Um, but do yeah. they have any political power or do they envy political power? Okay. Uh, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to speculate in, in their personal feelings towards it, but as you said, we we are also one of the constitutional monarchies, and, and our constitution in, in this regard is fairly new. It was uh, revised in the mid 70s and replaced the old 1809 constitution, and that severely restricted the political power of the monarchy. And in essence, it was a compromise between conservatives who who still wanted a strong monarchy and more liberal and social democratic uh, parties that wanted to replace it with a republic so they compromised and held sort of a ceremonial monarchy that's not to say that they don't have any political influence um, the king is still the uh, sort of ceremonial uh, head or chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, he uh, officially opens up the parliamentary year every fall and so on. But compared to the British royals, then the political influence of the Swedish monarchs are officially very restricted. Mm -hmm. However, I mean, as I said, you, they still wield a whole lot of informal powers and, and 
that of course comes with corruption and nepotism and and one of the major things that they are exempt from is the transparency that is uh, is generally held for all other sort of uh, state entities which means we we don't really know where our money goes and we we can't really tell what they do because they won't share that information they're exempt from that uh, transparency act so no, they don't hold much official political uh, power or influence, but they can still wield a lot of informal ones. All right, interesting. Um, for people joining us right now, uh, we have a debate about the documentary The Man Who Shot the King, produced by the British Republican Society Republic. Joining us is the head of that society, uh, Graham Smith. And Ola from Sweden, who is a member and a part of the board of the Swedish uh, 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 Society. We have more and more people joining us um, from the Dutch Antilles. Uh, I see some reactions coming in from the very south of our country. Um, if you have any questions, just drop them below uh, in on YouTube <coughs> so we can debate them. I've got quite some questions of our, uh, the head of the Dutch Republican Society. He's asking, um, obviously, uh, 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 the monarchy in, 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 in every country um, uh, is, is popular, uh, as it's, it's very much promoted, uh, and it's been promoted. Um, quite recently, we've had a poll here in the ne in Netherlands uh, around King's Day uh, asking how popular uh, is uh, um, the monarchy, and as it turns out, uh, approximately two thirds of the people uh, are in support of the monarchy. Um, just a quarter is in in favor of the uh, um, uh, of, uh, in favor of the republic. Um, how's that for how's that for for Sweden and Britain? St to start with with Britain. Well, the it's. A more complicated picture and it's worth doing some uh polling of your own because it, sometimes the questions different questions can they won't change the headline figure but they can sort of reveal some interesting detail so it's broadly speaking 75 percent of the british population want to keep the monarchy and it's roughly 20 percent that want to get rid of it however when you do a little bit of digging around in terms of how interested people are uh you know whether they really care that much about this issue then you start to find that support is fairly high but it's also quite shallow and people will uh, people are open-minded about it to a large extent and interested in uh possibly changing their minds if they're given a reason to do so and we've had quite a lot of big events as you might have noticed uh over the last 10 years um and all of those big events so there has, there was the wedding of uh, Prince William and Kate in 2011, the Jubilee in 2012, the uh, uh, what was it, the birth um, William and Kate's first baby in 2013. Then you had the wedding of Harry and uh, Meghan a couple of years ago. All of these events, the polling shows that the vast majority of people are not that interested and don't really care that much. And we did some polling around the time of the Harry and Meghan wedding, uh, which showed that most people don't have very strong feelings about any of the individuals uh it's roughly 50 50 as to whether people would care that much if it did go um so there are a lot of details in there and i do think that um i noticed there was a uh someone asking about younger people and i think that there is um uh there is some extent a, a growth of um opposition to the monarchy amongst younger people um whether that is sustained i don't know but i, I think that uh, certainly in the uk uh, there are various signs that um opinion is is weakening even if the headline figure isn't going down Ola, uh, uh, you are obviously the youngest of us three uh, as i understood you're in the end of your 20s yes correct i'm 28. you are 28. um are you one of many young republicans in sweden or, or is it quite hard to to just i would i would actually i would say that okay so we we had a uh, number crunching institute uh, came up to us and said okay so we we did the math right and if the trend continues 
the decreasing trend for the like support of monarchy, then you will have a majority by 2040. So of course you can, if you chart the trends, you can see that the official support for monarchy lowers all, and this goes back decades, right? However, I, as Graham said, this is also depends a lot on how you phrase questions, right? So it's it's hard to to do a, a, a certain polling of this. But but one thing that I would like to to acknowledge in this is that while we've had a couple of decades where each generation has been sort of more liberal and less conservative than the previous generation, and I'm a millennial and and we we might be a little more conservative than than the preceding generation but but mostly like more liberal in most in most ways what we see and this is where my political science uh, background comes in is that generation z or generation z meaning people born about 95 96 and, and onwards now until uh, early uh, 2000s they are more conservative than previous generations which could in essence mean that we see a backlash in this and that's what i'm afraid of because honestly just looking at the sort of political conscious uh, class of youngsters today you definitely see uh, an, a conservative backlash so it's hard to see it's hard to know if this trend of decreasing support for the monarchy is actually gonna gonna continue in the coming 10 15 years which is sad uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, but it's something that we need to be aware of. Well, it's, it's quite funny that uh, last year uh, was the very first time that the Dutch public uh, broadcaster NOS uh, did investigation uh, uh, among the popularity, among different age groups. And as it turns out, uh, younger people are less in favor of the monarchy. Um, and approximately 50% of all young people um, do not care for the monarchy as it is, meaning that some are Republican, uh, another part um, uh, is a monarchist, but still says, you know, no political power, just a ceremonial role. 50% um, is quite a lot. Um, yet you see that the older people get, uh, the more uh, traditional they get, the more uh, support uh, they will have for the monarchy. Um, I always found that a very, very particular phenomenon. Uh, you turn older, you start loving the crown. Help me here. I need I need an explanation for this. Well, yeah, I, I was just gonna say, yeah, it, but isn't that sort of the the ultimate expression of as you grow older, you also kind of grow more conservative and less radical? Um, I think it's just. A, I mean, to some extent, it's just natural that you know, as you get older, you have children, you have you know, mortgage or whatever. And your concerns become more personal and immediate, and you think about the you know the education system or the the economy yeah. and so on, and so you don't indulge yourself in in bigger issues that might not have an immediate impact on your life. That's fine, and I, I do think that you know it's been said for many years in this country that the younger people are more likely to support getting rid of the monarchy, but then of course those younger people become older people, and then and the next generation of younger people are more likely to support getting rid of the monarchy. But you know this is why we campaign because the the objective is to try and lock that in and get people to not change their mind so they may well think well uh you know this is no longer my top priority because i'm no longer uh you know free to worry about these things i've got you know children and, and a job and whatever but i still agree you know i still think that i haven't lost that i haven't lost that and you know so i think that there's a job of kind of making the issue mainstream making the view mainstream making it okay to be republican so that people don't feel it's a radical thing that you do in your misspent youth uh, and that it's okay to carry on uh supporting a republic as you get older even if it may not be your number one issue um when other things come up for everybody joining us uh right now we are halfway uh halfway uh uh, uh in an interview uh about the documentary the man who shouldn't be king a documentary made by the British Republican Society Republic. Um, of the British Republican Society, we have Graham joining us in the debate, as uh, Ola from the Swedish Republican Society. Um, we are debating the 
documentary as said, but we are debating uh, uh, the monarchy and uh, the favor of the monarchy as well um, to see if there is a comparison between the uh, different uh, countries in Europe that have a monarchy. Um, we were just debating uh, uh, the fact that younger people tend, as polls show in the Netherlands, tend to be less in favor of the monarchy. Um, uh, I still I still have a point there. Um, uh, because Ola, you said, well, as you grow old, you know, you lose more of your uh, uh, progressive uh, image and then uh, younger people tend to become more conservative as they grow up. Uh, but still, I think being in favor of a republic uh, or a monarchy is something very principal. You don't you don't throw that overboard as you grow old. No, but I feel like I, Graham had an excellent point there about uh, this is not something that really affects you in your, in your daily life. You you start worrying about schools and stuff like that for you, for your children. So it it might be that it the issue takes a back seat to other more pressing issues for you and your your radical side becomes a little more moderated i think yeah if i could just jump in very quickly first i mean the, the other thing is it this is why it's so important to make it a a material problem that needs to be fixed as well because people will who might just on principle think well you know this is something which definitely needs to change and i can put some energy into this when i've got more time uh, in my 20s um, but if you if you're saying well this is a real problem it needs to be fixed uh, and you know there's all sorts of areas whether it's misuse of money or constitution or whatever uh, then you're going to hold on to some of those uh, supporters and going back to what was said about um, people being more conservative uh, we have lots of conservative supporters and we we try and embrace that as well because we um, you know we know that we need people to see this as an issue that isn't attached to you know the radical young or to the left or whatever you know it has to be something which anybody can get on board with um and i just the other day did a uh, podcast which is now live with julia hartley brewer who's quite a a well-known radio presenter and journalist in this country known for supporting brexit and known for supporting this government uh, the, the conservative government and so on um but she's absolutely uh 100 a republican so that's a useful voice to get out there and say well you know this is not something which is uh confined to the young or to the left we are uh, still in this debate uh, uh for might you join in uh or, or have just joined in um if you have any question for graham of the republic society in great britain or Ulla from the republican society in sweden uh, just leave your comments down below i see one coming right now um, today is quite a warm day. Um, uh, uh, let me go before we go to Hans Maas, who has uh, uh, asked us a question. It's quite a warm day. Um, uh, originally, uh, we had King's Day plan, um, the celebration of the birthday of the king in the Netherlands, uh, as of the corona crisis. Uh, we can't, uh, and we're debating at home online uh, uh, about uh, the failure of the monarchy and need to get to a republic. Um, Hans Maas mentioned a little bit earlier in the comments that uh, um, obviously uh, 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 King's Day um, uh, is being used as a promotional tour. The royal family um, uh, travels through the country every year, visits one or, or, or more cities to promote themselves, promote the institution, um, and the whole thing is very much televised uh, and, and, and used to, to um, explain how wonderful and normal these people are. Um, How's that for, for Sweden? Do you have a King's Day? Do you have any other national celebration around the king? Uh, well, not not in in such. We like uh, April thirtieth uh, uh, is our uh, king's birthday, and and we we celebrate that. But it's not because of the king. We we have wall purges then, uh, so that's an old uh, tradition. Uh, but I would say the most eye catching. Uh, of these sort of propaganda things that you you mentioned is that e at the end of each year, our public service uh, television uh, corporation uh, they televise a uh, they a sort of program called the Year of the Royals, where they basically have this production where they follow the royals for for the entire year and like this is what they did oh look how great that was and 
how cozy it it's really just a a star portrait of a royal family and that happens every year towards the uh, end of december yeah um interesting thing is if you look at uh, uh how the monarchs uh, in the netherlands are portrayed um it's very much about the person it's very much about maxima the the, the, the queen it's about Willem alexander it's about their children um thus uh, creating some kind of uh, cloud around the monarchy, um, not talking about the monarchy itself, the election, <clears throat> but rather uh, about these people, um, uh, making any further discussion uh, rather impossible. Because um, if you are if you are not in favour of the monarchy, you're basically saying I don't like these people. Is is that the case in Britain as well? Well, I mean, to some extent, I think that. Um, we have a lot of this nonsense, uh, royal reporting, lots of stupid uh, documentaries that, you know, done by journalists, but there's no journalistic uh, merit or integrity to them. It's just puff pieces to promote them. And um, it's all very dishonest. But our media, I think, uh, has, has a curious relationship with our royals. They like to go along with it, uh, particularly our broadcasters, but the press are quite happy to have a go when, um, when they think it will sell papers. Um, and I think that in the past, uh, it's certainly been a lot more difficult to criticize uh, individual royals or even the monarchy because it was tied up with these two issues. And this is why we've always, as long as I've been involved in the Republic, I've always made a point of criticizing the royals, uh, so long as it's fair, um, so long as it's on the, in the same, sort of by the same measure that we might criticize a politician, because you have to get people used to the idea that they, that they are fair game you know the the shock value wears off and people start to get used to the fact that okay there are these people that that make legitimate criticisms and as long as it is legitimate and not personal uh then it's fine um now sometimes you know I, you may have seen that the queen delivered a message uh to the british people a couple of weeks ago uh regarding the coronavirus it was a pretty dire message but uh, the um the coverage around it was fawning and you know it's all oh well you know it wasn't this wonderful and a politician couldn't possibly have made this kind of message um despite the fact that it was harking back to the war when a politician was making lots <laughs> lots of much better uh speeches but um i tweeted just a few minutes beforehand uh before it went live saying um from the republic account saying you know the queen is a public figure like anyone else and she should be held to the same sort of standards as politicians held accountable and so on um that had a very large positive reaction, but also a very large negative one, including a, a well-known journalist, Piers uh, Morgan, who retweeted it and swore at us for daring to criticize. Well, it wasn't even a criticism, to be honest. It was just a point about the fact that she is, uh, as much as anyone, open to criticism and uh, scrutiny. So, yeah, can you I get a- you get... Can I paraphrase and basically say that um, uh, uh, media say any, uh, a criticism against the monarchy they say well that's that's a personal attack and you shouldn't be doing that because these people can not necessarily no i mean it, it depends on what it is you're saying and who it is you're talking about the queen more so i think if you if you criticize the queen people um are not keen on that but if you criticize prince charles um then that's that these days that's a lot more acceptable and that, part of that is because our press is a lot more um well, I don't know whether it's more uh, robust than other press, but I mean, it's certainly very happy to go on the attack against people like Charles if there's a story. Um, but also because we've been, you know, working to make the point all the time that uh, you know that it's perfectly okay to, to criticise these people, um, and that's been going on for some time. I mean, Prince Andrew is the obvious example, although that you know that is a pretty awful <laughs> example in terms of the allegations against him. But Prince Harry has been criticised a lot. Uh, over leaving the royal family, Prince Edward was criticised a lot 20 years ago, um, and uh, and even Prince Harry and Kate have been criticised uh, from time to time. But it just really depends on what's being said and done, and which which bit of the media is is commenting. Yeah. If you have just joined in, we are debating uh, the documentary "The Man Who Shouldn't Be King" with the head of the British Republican Society, Graham Smith. Uh, with us as well is Ola Nekvist, who is a, a member and board member of the Swedish Republican Society. Um, Republicans just quite recently launched this documentary. 
Um, if people haven't seen this yet, it's out on YouTube. Uh, I believe that we will uh, already have uh, uh, leave a link uh, in this debate. So if people haven't seen it, uh, uh, go and see it. Um, I do have a question though. Um, as uh, 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 the Dutch Republican Society, obviously the, the British uh, are not supported by uh, uh, the government. Uh, um, though you have a political uh, view, uh, you don't get any subsidies from the state in what you do. So your 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 funding is limited. But still, make a movie. That's quite an expensive project. I I, I would I would presume. Uh, why make a movie? Well, we raised money for it uh, specifically, and. Um... One of the reasons is that if you do a project like that, it's much easier to raise money, which then also um, covers uh, other costs as well. It helps us to, to sort of it becomes a vehicle for the for the wider campaign. But ultimately, there's you know there isn't a film like it, so you know we get the opportunity to say you know to decide what gets said, uh, who gets interviewed, um, and it does help people to see to, to sort of hear the message much more clearly than it might do if they just caught us for for a minute on the national news so um it's a number of reasons for making the movie i suppose is one it helps to give us a vehicle for for saying more about the campaign it does actually help us to fundraise um but also then it helps to uh give people an opportunity to find out more without um without having to sort of catch us on the news or, or come to an event. And that movie now is, of course, uh, available on our YouTube channel. So people can watch it um, and will be watching it for, for many months and years to come. Graham, who, yeah. do you, who do you focus on? Are these uh, your members just showing them, you know, this is what we came up with? Or would you like to reach out to a broader public, maybe informing them? And no, yeah, absolutely. Border public, so I mean, it, as well as our membership. So obviously, it does help to galvanise an interest in our membership. Um, a lot of them have probably heard the issues before, but uh, for a lot of people who haven't engaged with the public before, a lot of these issues will be new, and they won't necessarily understand that Prince Charles does all this kind of thing, or how much it costs, or whatever. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of people are told by the media that the Duchy of Cornwall, for example, is a private a state that belongs personally to Prince Charles, which isn't true. So it, it sort of gives people a fresh perspective. The original plan was to hold a number of screenings up and down the country. Um, and we managed to do, I think, three of those at the beginning of this year before the lockdown kicked in. So we had to cancel all that and uh, in the step put it on YouTube and promoted it through that. And um, we, we will uh, be promoting it further through the media as well. But uh, obviously the, the virus and the lockdown and everything else has disrupted that a bit. But, it, you know, it's, it's, it's over 10,000 views and it, it, we'll, we will be doing more to promote it um, to get that number far higher. So I think it's, it's just, I guess, for most of the time, if people want to find out about it, they either, either have to read a book or uh, read our website and they might catch a few bits on YouTube or, or wherever. Um, and this is a, an opportunity to showcase the whole argument but to frame it around the person who's going to be the next king now, uh, one might say that you are a, Repu a republican uh, talking about the monarchy um this is not really objective uh, uh obviously you will portray uh, uh charles um uh, as somebody who is he's is is doing wrong uh and and you should get uh, uh the whole rid of the whole idea of, of monarchy as soon as possible um, what would you say to them? Uh, obviously, you have a certain standpoint in this. Yes, and I, I don't. You know, we we make no claim to objectivity. What we do make a claim to is accuracy. And you know, it uh, a lot of these things are misrepresented in the mainstream media. Um, and our film is very clearly a Republican film. It's very clearly made by us. Um, it starts with uh, a piece. Um, a bit of footage of me on a on a BBC radio program, and it uh, you know it's very clearly. I mean, the title makes it makes it clear that this is not objective, but I think it it is factual. It is, it is uh, relying on some serious uh, commentary from, from people that know what they're talking about, um, and uh, it's what is missing from it is all the sort of fluff and fawning that you normally get on the BBC, for example, where people will simply go on about Prince Charles's charity work or whatever it is, um, or the uh, the cheese you might make in Cornwall. But, uh, you know, this is actually looking at the serious issues. And um, 
and I think people will take from that what they want. Uh, you know, not everything has to be objective. You know, but this is an opinion. This is a, a point of view. But it, but it is uh, the film is really putting that point of view across in a way that says there are serious reasons for having this point of view. Yes, you say it's not your main goal to be uh, to be objective. Uh, this obviously is a subjective view about the monarchy. Um, I must say that in debate with with people, whether they be uh, Republicans or, or monarchists, uh, people always say, well. You know, you are obviously not uh, uh, the one to judge, as you are a Republican. So uh, basically, you being a Republican um, uh, 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 just cancels you as as a as a potential uh, um, as somebody in in a debate. How do you how do you feel but, about that, uh, Ola? Are you being taken seriously uh, um, uh, in debate uh, in the media? Yes. I mean, I. I, I... I was just talking to someone, a former MP, who was making the similar point in a podcast that we've got coming up. That uh, quite often say, "Oh, well, you would say that you're a Republican." And it's like, well, the real answer is, well, you would say what you're saying because you're a monarchist. I mean, why does that make a difference? I mean, the point is, I'm not saying that we should get rid of the monarchy because I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican because I've looked at the monarchy and I think, well, this doesn't make any sense, you know. And I'm not making this film because you know there's some little bit in my head that says you're a, you are a Republican, therefore. This is what you think. I, I look at these facts and I, and I tell them as I see them. And, uh, you know, I always keep coming back to the conclusion that, uh, that you know, this is not an institution that we should be supporting. So, you know, if anybody says that, just throw it right back in their face. They can't say, look, you know, you can't discuss this issue because you are a Republican. You are a Republican because you've thought about it and you've, you've come to a conclusion which is entirely valid. And if they are supporting the monarchy, then why, why, is that the default position that, that, that also can't be challenged? Yeah. How about you, uh, Ola? Do you have problems uh, uh, getting getting your points through, um, uh, or do people, uh, as they do here in the Netherlands and obviously in Britain, say, well, as you are a Republican, obviously you, you have a very subjective way of looking at the world, uh, um, and and your points are, are rather not taken seriously. No, I feel like we. I'm, I'm being taken seriously if I discuss this. I mean, sure, you you have some ardent monarchy supporters that are always going to do some jabs at you, and there are some people who might think that this is not a, an issue worthwhile to engage in. It's it's good the way it is, but if I feel like for the most part, since most people either don't care or have very vague opinions on it. If we engage them in, on the subject, we're taken seriously and they can understand our side of the story, even if they don't necessarily agree with us or they don't have they, they don't really have an opinion at all. Honestly, the the people who would make fun of you for this or say that our opinions are invalid, uh, they're they're a very minute minority, I would say. The, I don't feel sure they're they're often a loud uh, minority, but for the most part, it it's a it's a fairly it's it's a fairly okay climate to debate in. I I, I very rarely find myself not being taken seriously. As we uh, uh, continue our debate and are already uh, almost fifty minutes live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, I would like to ask everybody following our, uh, our discussion, uh, if you have any questions uh, or comments, uh, leave them below uh, so uh, we can talk about them. If you have some direct questions to Ola or Graham, uh, 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 leave them below. And just saying hi, that's always very nice. Uh, I know that quite some people have urged to go outside because it's very sunny in the Netherlands. Um, I see that people comment my voice. Well, thank you very much about that. Um, uh, but leave your, your, your questions as well, uh, as I think this is a very interesting opportunity to talk about uh, the monarchy, uh, about uh, republicanism with not only the Dutch Republican Society, but with the Swedes and the British as well. Um, while watching the documentary, Graham, uh, I, I was very much surprised as how many, how much people were actually willing to speak out, uh, whereas uh, I, I believe that a lot of people here in the Netherlands believe that once you speak out against monarchy or, or reveal something, um, you know, uh, the, this will, lack, will will lower your chances of getting a great job or lower your chances of doing anything. Um, it's not very smart speaking out against the, the monarchy. 
did you have did you have any did you while making this uh, did you have any any uh, serious uh, backs then did you have have people working against you uh, not to come out well i mean there were certainly people that we asked to contribute to the film who declined um particularly who you know ordinary people who happened to be uh, living on Dutchy land, uh, and this was commented on in the film that uh, people are are scared of the Dutchy specifically. So um, they don't, if they're living on their land, they don't want to uh, cause any trouble. There were some politicians we asked that uh, that declined, even though they might have had something uh, useful to say. Um, so there is an element to that, but I think there are plenty of people these days more than there were maybe thirty years ago. Um, who are quite happy to to speak up. So yeah, there there is still an issue. I don't know whether I don't know what people's worries are. I suppose they might still worry about jobs and so on. I mean, there have been people in the past that have got themselves into hot water. Uh, there's a DJ, I think, back at the time of the royal wedding in 2011 that got into hot water about making some comments. There's uh, a comedian that made a rather rude comment about the Queen. Uh, he got got into uh, a lot of trouble and. Um, even the Church of England uh, vicar, I think he was in London, that got into some trouble. But um, but on the whole, you know, there are enough people that are willing to speak out. But um, it, again, it's, it's the challenge to make it mainstream so that people feel able to to talk about it. Um, and this used to be the case in Australia, for example. It's worth um, uh, looking at that example where back in the eighties, you know, you might have had a similar reaction because of the, the Labour government in the 90s uh, pushing and then getting a referendum, you know, everything changed. And now it's uh, it's much easier to be a Republican than a monarchist in Australia. So um, it's, it's kind of reversed. So, um, yeah, I, th I think there there are issues in terms of whether anybody actually tried to stop us from making it. No, not really. But I mean, the, the Duchy of Cornwall uh, became aware that we were doing it and they phoned us fairly quickly and <laughs> tried to find out what we were up to. Um, what did they say? You're well, making a movie. Don't do that. Yeah, well, we tried. We were on the Silly Isles, which are uh, just off the uh, west coast of Cornwall, um, and we contacted the local representative of the Duchy, asking for an interview because a lot of people on the Silly Isles who are tenants of the Duchy were complaining about the way they're treated, and uh, we got through to the this local sheriff's uh, representative or secretary or whatever, and they said, "Oh, you know, we'll take your message." And an hour later, it's someone in london uh that phoned us saying uh you know what are you doing and can we find out more about the film you're making and then they just simply tried to um tell us that everything is happy and rosy and you know the duchy have a great relationship with their tenants and and uh, their representative wasn't going to do interviews um i think they even claimed that they never do interviews even though we'd seen uh, such an interview on uh online so um yeah they they were just very wary of what we were doing and i'm sure that uh whether they've i'm sure they have watched the film to see, see whether there's anything well, you haven't libelous. any proactive uh, uh uh counter uh um measures of the crown of anybody who's in favor of the crown in britain uh, of you making a movie no no, no not at all i mean I, I think that if we are successful in getting getting a much higher profile then you may find a reaction but um you know, again, it's a film that is, you know, yes, it comes from a, a Republican perspective, but it's it's based in fact. You know, it's accurate. Uh, it would be hard to really do anything that uh, that might um, that might challenge it. And I think the royals themselves would be very, very reluctant to do anything in terms of any legal challenge because that would ensure overnight that uh, everybody knows about us and and our membership would uh, rocket, uh, you know, through the roof if they did that. Yeah. Um, while we debate, questions come in. Uh, uh, I even have people texting me uh, um, for me and us to react. Uh, please leave your comments below on Facebook and YouTube. Um, we've got one question um, as to, you know, we are debating republicanism. We are debating uh, the monarchy in uh, Sweden and Great Britain and Holland. Um, Thomas Jolens is saying, you know, uh, you can't compare these countries. Obviously, uh, the monarchy is a little bit different, as I understood from his question. And uh, um, there is no, there's no, it has no sense of, of actually comparing them. Uh, as we all are, are gathered in the uh, 
Association of European Republican Movements, the AERM, of which the logo is just how to do that, is just in that right corner of your screen. Um, how about that? How about that? Is do do the different monarchies? Um, uh, is there is there such a major difference between them? All of them. Um, yeah, sure. I, I feel like they're uh, just seeing this movie. I feel like there's um, there's a big difference in the sense that while the Swedish monarchy disposes of a lot of land and and whatnot, they they do not wield this power to my knowledge. I I be hard pressed to find an example where they have tenants in in this way or it, it wouldn't surprise me uh, but i i can't really come up with an example of uh, just relating to thomas's question here if some something comparable to cornwall or lancaster that i i would find so and and just as graham said the uk doesn't have a a formal constitution we we actually have a formal constitution which put which puts limits on our uh, monarchs in what they can say what they can do and and the power they the formal power that they wield so in that sense the monarchies are very different in some other ways they're comparable and as we talked about the costs are comparable the uh, just the idea of monarchy in and of itself from a democratic standpoint that those are comparable across the board because they're, they're of course the same fundamental question right and so in some ways they differ in some ways i would find them comparable it, it, it's hard to say one way or the other or another just straight up it has enough comparison uh, uh, as to work together in a more european perspective sorry was that one could say uh, it has uh, uh, enough comparison uh, to to work together in a European. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, we we work together on this issue because we find that it overlaps so to the extent that we we can still uh, find each other's experiences uh, something that we can learn from. Absolutely. Yeah. Graham is still here. I see you loading once in a while. Uh, 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 the interesting thing is, uh, talking about international cooperation, um, uh, in the documentary, there's a very short part which you go, you go to uh, Brexit um, and the, uh, uh, the, the royal uh, say in that. Um, is that one thing you would like to do, such a thing, Graham? As Brexit obviously is, is very controversy, a, a very big controversy in, 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 in the national debate in Britain. Um, why should you bring this up? Obviously, you're going to lose, well, I think you'll, you'll lose some people who say, you know, we are very much against Brexit or that's our right. You know, we speak out. It's kind of a hard point bringing that up. Well, I mean, we don't take a view on Brexit. I've got my own views. But I mean, uh, um, you know, the, the membership and supporter base of Republic is as divided as the rest of the UK on that issue. The film, uh, the point made in the film really is that um, we were going through a very particular crisis. I'd say that there was a huge amount of political uncertainty. And of course, you know, we'll see what happens after the, uh, the current coronavirus crisis. Um, but I mean, the, the Brexit thing hasn't gone away. But certainly before the last election, there was a huge amount of uncertainty going on for two or three years. Uh, there was a risk of um, further electoral uncertainty if there was another hung parliament. There, were, um, there was a whole um, row about the fact that the Prime Minister suspended Parliament um, for a length, uh, quite a long time, uh, which was then ruled to be unconstitutional. And the point about how that is relevant to what we're talking about is twofold. Firstly, we have an absent head of state. We have a head of state who has a constitutional role to play, but is not willing to play it because if uh, she gets it wrong, then that could jeopardise the entire institution. But then we are faced with the prospect of King Charles, uh, who is more inclined to play a role and to interfere. And if he was on the throne at that time, who knows what he might have done or or said. And there needs to be clarity. You know, there needs to be a very clear role to play for head of state. And if there is a role to play, then that role has to be accountable if they get it wrong. So it was kind of saying, look, you know, it's this whole thing about fixing your roof when the sun is shining. The sun wasn't shining in Britain last year, and it was very clear that there are a whole load of holes in the roof, and we have 
uh, it, it really the whole Brexit process exposed the monarchy as being rather um, pointless on one hand, but also not being this sort of independent arbiter. It was very much the Queen does what she's told by the Prime Minister. And so uh, we caught, sort of got away with it, partly because the government then went ahead and won a, a majority. Uh, and um, it, the constitutional issues sort of sorted themselves out. Um, and because the Queen just did the bare minimum. But, the you know, a King Charles may have made that situation far worse and, and may make a future situation far worse as well. Yeah. Um, we are talking about the documentary, The Man Who Shouldn't Be King, uh, about Prince Charles. Um, I was wondering, why make, why make a documentary about somebody who's not a monarch yet? Uh, um, why not focus on the person of uh, Elizabeth? Obviously, she has 50 somewhat years uh, uh, of, of, of governance, of, of being uh, the head of state. Uh, obviously, there's much more to say about that. Why focus on this position? Why focus on this person of Charles? Well, I mean, it, the point is, it doesn't really matter who the monarch is. The situation is intolerable. The institution is indefensible. Um, you know, the Queen, however, she her career, if you can put it like that, as head of state is behind her. She's 94. Um, it's unlikely she'll be the Queen at the end of this decade. Um, and the concern is about the future, you know, and the message is really about we ought to choose our next head of state, whether we wait for the Queen uh, to die or whether we do this tomorrow, it's going to be our next head of state that we uh, want to choose. Um, and King Charles, the prospect of King Charles, which you know, that may happen tomorrow. It may happen. It may have already happened whilst, we're, <laughs> whilst we've been live on it. Uh, you know, it, it, we don't know when that's going to happen. Um, and that's, the, and that's uh, a part of the argument. But King Charles uh, is a very clear advertisement as to why the institution doesn't work um, and why it is right both in principle and in practice that we should be able to choose our head of state. So he is a an example, a, a way of framing the discussion that makes the wider point that the monarchy itself needs to go. So this isn't about saying, well, let's move him aside and have King William, for example. It's about saying that this is what happens when you have a monarchy. This is the, these are all the, the things that go wrong with the monarchy. And, and William might be the same. William might be the same, but then do it more subtly. I don't know. But, uh, you know, you can't leave it to the whims of, of chance. Uh, uh, you have to uh give us a chance to to choose who that next person's going to be it's it's still not sure if uh charles will ever ascend the throne because that's up to, it's up to elizabeth uh, as a sorry elizabeth whoever uh she appoints uh, to be king no the, the, the british constitution is quite clear it will be it will be charles it the will. only way yeah the queen doesn't have a say in this it's it's, it's written in law that um it, it's a very strange law it's written in the uh about 300 years ago it says that um or was it 200 years ago? It says that the monarch will be the heir and successor of the Electress of Hanover, uh, an area of Germany where um, King George uh, originated from. Um, so that will be Charles. Now, the only way that it won't be Charles is either Charles um, declines the, the position, which he's never going to do, or he dies before his mum. Uh, in which case it becomes William. But no, it will be Charles. And it, 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 is, it is instantaneous. You know, the moment that a doctor arrives and declares that the Queen is, uh, is dead, um, Charles is king. Um, and there's the only way that you can stop that from happening is by getting rid of the monarchy during the Queen's reign. Yeah. The, only, the only news we get about Charles, as, as obviously I've been trying to uh, learn a little bit more about the person, um, the only news that you have um, is obviously the news as as um, uh, portrayed by the uh, royal family. Uh, uh, um, it's not very clear who who this person is. Obviously, your documentary shows a lot about him. Um, what might we uh, expect? What might the Brits expect whenever he ascends the throne? It's very hard to say. I mean, he has been outspoken over the last 40 years. He has made his opinions very clear. His opinions are um, not mainstream. They're rather eccentric. Um, sort of a conservative mysticism is one way of putting it. Um, I think his ideal world is where we all go back to plowing the fields and he lives in his grand manner. But um, 
I think also his personality has been revealed in various ways in terms of being rather uh, thin-skinned and, and defensive and you know, demanding deference and so on, being very intolerant of criticism. Um, so the only question really is whether that comes out publicly when he's king or whether it is something that is kept private. Um, he has been compared to Trump, uh, not um, quite so crass and not quite so brash, but certainly um, sort of someone who perhaps hasn't grown up enough and doesn't like to be challenged. Um, so, they, yeah, it, it depends on whether people around him can keep him uh, uh, quiet. But even if he's kept quiet, then you have questions about what he's doing in uh, behind closed doors. And we face a very real danger where a government that is in power at the time that he becomes king has a particular policy, and then two years later it decides to change that policy, and all of a sudden that policy is in line with what Prince Charles has been talking about over the last 40 years. And the question will often be asked, why was that changed? Was it changed because the government looked at the evidence and decided that was the right thing for the country, or was it because Prince Charles has been leaning on them, uh, making various uh, threats of causing them embarrassment or whatever, um, and, uh, and or, or just simply talking to sycophantic ministers who who love to do the king's bidding. So, um, you know, there are serious concerns there um, about uh, what he's going to be like, and he he um, he's not someone to be trusted to do the role in any you know sort of appropriate manner. Yeah, um, we just uh, quite uh, a couple of questions ago we discussed a Brexit. Um, you said obviously his mother is a little bit more uh, diplomatical about Brexit. Uh, I see uh, 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 getting a very, very strong stance, and that could potentially uh, threaten her position as a whole. Um, Charles isn't. I understood from your from your answer earlier. No, Charles hasn't said anything about Brexit. None of them have um, directly. They. They know, you know, they, they don't get involved in the most controversial issues very often. It's their own pet issues. Um, and this is quite telling, though. I mean, you know, Prince Charles's lobbying has been revealed over the years uh, on and off, but it's always his own agenda. It's not the issues that are most pressing for the country. So he, he never wavers from what he's interested in. Um, and I don't know that Brexit will make a lot of difference for them. Personally, um, I suppose they have an opinion, but I don't suppose it's uh, particularly well thought out or uh, informed. Um, the Queen has made interventions on these issues from time to time, but they're very, very carefully worded um, and they are on the advice of the government. So um, famously, a few days before the Scottish referendum in 2014, she made a comment about everyone having to think very carefully about what they decide. And this was taken as a cue to vote for uh, remaining as part of the UK. And that uh, certainly upset a lot of people in Scotland. Um, and there have been similar comments over the years, but uh, they try and avoid the most controversial issues. Yeah. We are still debating. We are uh, one hour and seven minutes on our way uh, in this first, uh, uh, basic first internet debate uh, among Republicans in Europe. Um, uh, thank you for your comment, Liddy. Uh, uh, as comments uh, go in, uh, and come in. Uh, we would like to use this opportunity to to answer uh, uh, any question might you have that about the monarchy, about this documentary, um, uh, or about republicanism. Um, as I saw the documentary, and I now have seen it twice, I must say that um, this really pictures a rather grim image of the monarchy. Um, one would expect, uh, 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 with such a documentary coming out, um, why right the monarchy uh, in the first place? Uh, as as uh, uh, Charles has a very strong, uh, or, or it has his, he uses uh, his power. Um, uh, it costs a lot of money uh, to maintain the system. Um, do you expect after this movie comes out, uh, more and more people joining in, Graham? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that's the that's the purpose of it, really, and I think it I think it is persuasive. I think people have watched it and um, thought very clearly. Well, okay, this isn't what I thought the the monarchy was all about. You know, they, they most people in Britain don't know what the monarchy is about, and they don't know the details of, of things like the duchy. And I'd say, if I just I know we're running out of time, but uh, this book has just come out by Norman Baker, um, for, who is a former MP, and 
he's been saying the same thing to me recently that you know people that read it that aren't necessarily republicans are persuaded fairly quickly that uh, this is a problem uh, because they they read for the first time some of these awful details about the the corruption the misuse of money the abuse of power and so on so um it's uh you know the big challenge for us and also an opportunity for us as as campaigners is to get the facts and the arguments in front of people and i think that people are very open to persuasion once they see uh, how bad the monarchy actually is. One could say that uh, whereas republicanism is very much something uh, about argument, about uh, a reasonable argument, whereas uh, supporters of the monarchy uh, tend to lean more towards emotion. You know, it's always been there, it's historic, it's culture, um, uh, it defines who we are. Um, does a movie like this, shouldn't, shouldn't it rather, instead of being very uh, argumental and very factual in the emotion. Well, I think it, I think it does touch on that as well. I mean, it, there are there are emotional arguments, uh, you know, the principled argument. Um, but people get angry about misuse of power. They get angry about misuse of uh, taxpayers' money. Um, so you know, I think it it generates that emotion as well. So, uh, but you know, the, there there needs to be two sides of the argument. It can't simply be facts without the emotion it can't be emotion without the facts and i think that we try to um to to debate. tackle both of those in the in the film yeah one of the very last questions uh, i have is um i found the title rather peculiar you are uh republican society of great britain um uh, uh, and you question yourself whether you should be king or not uh, uh, is that basically is that something you'd like to debate? Are you not in favour of just abolishing the whole thing uh, as it is instead of just debating whether he, he he ought to be a good king or not? Well, the point is, is that arguing about whether Charles is king is a way of saying that the monarchy should be abolished. So it's not, um, you know, it is a way of framing that particular discussion because what it does is highlight certain serious practical issues. It highlights. Um, the principle it highlights the failure of the monarchy as a, as a whole system of choosing someone that you know you're going to end up with someone who is entirely unsuitable for the role and um uh you know so it's a, it's a way of saying this is not an institution that works in in the modern society um or i mean quite frankly it has never worked but uh, in the interest of the the ordinary people but um you know it's not sustainable so it's kind of a way of saying look you know this isn't about this guy not being a good king, let's get a good king from somewhere else. It's about saying, this is what the monarchy gives you. Uh, you're going to get it whether you like it or not. And the way to uh, have someone else is to have an election. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, with us uh, are Graham Smith of the Republican Society in Great Britain and Ola Nixit of the Swedish Republican Society. We've been debating the documentary, The Man Who Shouldn't Be King. Um, which is out on YouTube for everyone to see. It's a very interesting documentary, I must say. Uh, rather professionally made. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, joining us on King's Day in the Netherlands to debate this. Um, for everybody following us uh, 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 on YouTube and on Facebook, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, please leave all your questions. Might you still have them? Uh, we will try to answer them uh, in a, a different way on a different channel. Um, I hope this might be a start of further debate uh, with our European friends, European Republican friends, I might, might say. Thank you very much. Um, the sun is still out. I think I will enjoy a little bit of sun today. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank we'll you for each other very soon again. Thank um, you. Thank you. Please leave your questions, but ask us as well what kind of uh, uh, arguments, what kind of things you would like to have debated. Uh, and next time we go live. Thank you very much for following us and see you next time.